Well, we'll, we'll, I guess, talk a little bit about um, why we're here, and uh, I'll introduce some of our panelists so that we don't lose too much more time. You know, so uh, to my left, um, to, you know, to your left, actually. Um, first, we have uh, Stacy, um, who's with the Partnership for New York City, um, with the, um, um, there we go, Director for Innovative Programs. Um, Stacy was, um, she's from Detroit. Uh, you Michigan grad. She was the co-founder and CEO of CART, which has grocery deliveries. And she's also she also was a senior mobility strategist for the city of Detroit before she moved recently to New York. Um, and, is, and the partnership for New York, she'll talk a little bit more about it when she's up. Um, we also have uh, Cody, who's, well, by the way, thanks for sponsoring Uber this session. Did you the sponsor? Um, Your drink last night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cody's an urban planner. He's uh, from originally from Illinois, from uh, the University of Illinois and um, in Chicago. He's a transit planner uh, at Marin Transit for several years, and before that he worked for CTA, and now he's with uh, Uber Transit. And last but not least, we have uh, our designated hitter, <laughs> uh, Noah Fox, yeah. um, who, from Enterprise. Um, he's been there for over eight years. He's also from from uh, went to school in Michigan. And um, this panel is going to talk about back to work, what the new normal is. Um, we have a whole bunch of slides we're going to go over, but um, maybe. <laughs> but um, yeah, so this, we're also going to talk about the Uber Taxi Partnership a little bit. Um, I'm going to moderate today. My name is Matt Doss. Um, I was the former taxi commissioner in New York. Um, I have three hats now. I'm a uh, this former distinguished lecturer and now a transportation technology chair at the City University of New York at City College. We have a transportation center there. I'm president of the ITR, which is the Regulators Association. Uh, th those are state and local, mostly government agencies that regulate taxis, TNCs, uh, paratransit vehicles, and some other odds and ends. Um, and I'm also a lawyer. We're a proud sponsor, Wendell's Marks of the conference. Um, we are a full service transportation mobility practice. There's not a practice like us in the country. Um, we basically represent mobility providers and um, as well as do work for governments uh, in the space uh, on a full service platform. Basically everything, every any type of legal work that's possible, but we understand transportation. So um, I'm going to moderate today and I'm going to kind of set the stage once Rudy gets uh, some of these uh, slides going with what's happened since the pandemic. I think it's fair to say that I think we all know how bad it was. Um, you know, some industries, my industries, you know, the taxi for hire TMC industries that I deal with came to a screeching halt. Uh, the mayor of New York City, um, not every mayor, but the mayor of New York City banned shared rides um, during the pandemic. Um, people who didn't have outright bans, oh, there we go. Um, people who didn't have outright bans during the pandemic, it's on yours now. But this will work. Okay, we've got some action. There we go. All right, I think we covered me. Um, how do we? How do we? All right. Why don't we? Why don't we just work from this thing? I guess I, we should have just stopped with the program. <laughs> Separate PowerPoints. This is a, a blunder on my part, so sorry. Um, okay. All right. So why don't we just work from this thing? All right. So I think we covered all the bios already. So let's get into it. Um, John Weaver, the new chair of the MTA. Um, I, I don't know if I agreed with him the other day. He said that uh, hybrid work poses no threat to New York's recovery. Um, I guess we can debate that and talk about it here a little bit. Um, we have some employers that are saying we're never going back to work in person. Um, this has created, I think, a new normal. Um, I think there's a lot of people during the pandemic who felt that, you know, this when this comes to an end, we're going to go back to normal. And I think that's clearly 
unequivocally not the case. You know, there is a new normal, and we're going to talk about that today. Um, so here's just some, you know, return to work trends. I'm going to set the stage, and then our panelists are going to talk about a couple of answers to questions. That's part of the panel, and then we're going to go to you in the audience. So remote work is here to stay. It's going to increase into 2023. There's a lot of reports and research coming out on this. Data scientists at Ladders um, have indicated that 20%, 25% of all professional jobs in North America will be remote by the end of this year, um, and remote opportunities are going to continue beyond that. Um, honestly, I was just telling Stacy, you know, I was doing remote work with my staff before the pandemic. You know, it was, but it was kind of like a carrot and stick thing. Like if you actually build a certain number of hours or you did some really good job, we give you a bank of work at home days. You know, so I think this is a thing that kind of came along with the millennial generation. And I think it was very well received. But now like we're in the aftermath of this, you know, I can tell you as a law firm in New York City, nobody is wants to be the first law firm to tell people you're ordered to come back to work. So everyone's kind of in a waiting mode. And, and you know, our, we're like, on, you know, with, the, with the, um, the great resignation looming over everybody, nobody wants to be in the situation where they're the first firm and then they have a mass resignation and then people start, you know, floating around. And I think there's a lot of other industries like that. But just as a lawyer in New York, you know, I can tell you that this is a big thing that's on our minds and we're very gentle. We, you know, we're, telling, we're, we're holding a party to get people to come back to the office. We're trying to get them back in on Wednesdays. But I basically spoke up in a partnership meeting. I said, why are we like doing staggered schedules and all this nonsense? I go into the office, you know, and there's like three people there. Like, what's the point? You know, you know, to have that collaboration with colleagues. I mean, I see some startups and some of my clients going back into the office, but they, they're starting to pick days, you know, like usually not a Monday or a Friday, she's like a, a Wednesday or a Thursday. So we may see some more of that. Um, remote opportunities left, left from under 4% at all high paying jobs before the pandemic to about 9% at the end of 2020 to more than 15% today. Um, there's also our labs has a, a state of remote work report that came out last year. Um, you know, and 90% of the 2050 full-time remote workers surveyed in their survey said they were as productive or more productive working remotely compared to when they were in the office. 74% said that after the pandemic, working from home is better for their mental health. And 84% reported that working remotely after the pandemic would make them happier. And many, with many even willing to take a pay cut. I don't know, I didn't answer that way. Uh, <laughs> COVID-19 COVID impact. And so at the height of the pandemic, you know, I talked a little bit about this. We, there was a lot of, and I see, you can see the hotel rates of like, I don't know if anybody's noticed this, but they've doubled. Like there's a lot of businesses that are making up for, um, you know, lost money and lost revenue and using inflation and supply chain as an excuse. But we're seeing this across the board in a lot of different industries. Um, you know, in the taxi industry, it's obviously regulated. The fare is regulated. But, you know, I'll leave uh, Cody to talk about what Uber's doing in that regard. Um, so, um, you know, there's still, like, there's a new dynamic. As we all know, we talk about it at this conference all day long, right? Um, you know, in New York City, for instance, like many other cities, we have tons of people on micromobility. It's just exploded. You know, like e-scooters were a concern. Not, they're not a concern anymore. You know, it used to be all that talk about liability. I mean, it's really the Wild West in New York City. I mean, um, every everybody has, uh, you know, e-scooters and e-bikes. They're riding them in all different directions. There's little to no enforcement. But people are using the e-bikes uh, to get to work. There's all sorts of contraptions which were not there before the pandemic happened. I think a lot of cities are experiencing this. Policymakers have been loath to, like, stop this activity. So I think it plays into the agenda that we have in, in many ways, um, you know, for shared mobility. So that's a positive development. Um, and in terms of modal shift, and APTA has some really good materials on this too, um, public transit ridership, as we know, declined. Um, as of early May, uh, ridership data nationally was only about 54% of what it was pre-pandemic. New car registrations, we've seen this, um, these reports going back for a year and a half at least reached a 10 year high of 1.6 million. Um, it exceeds any monthly result during the four year stretch from 2015 through 2018, the highest volume four year stretch in history. This is obviously bad news for the folks at uh, shared use mobility, kind of flies in the face of everything that we've been working on for years. Um, and it also should be noted that the reductions in commuting due to working from home do not offset mode shift 
from public transit to car driving, resulting in a net increase in car use after the pandemic. The pandemic also boosted the use of bikes, with sales surging well into 2021. I bought an e-bike yesterday. I'm excited about it. Uh, and the nightlife. I want to talk about this quickly. And this great report that APTA has out on this, by the way. You know, um, workers, first of all, we're just talking about, you know, bars and restaurants and the nightlife industry and how they've been suffering. And they're having a difficult time getting workers back. But also now with the cuts in ridership and so forth, those workers getting home is also a problem that's, that has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, and, you know, also, you know, with the increase in car usage, uh, without having some type of mobility hub solution, which the nightlife districts and nightlife mayors, quote unquote, have been doing around different cities and places like Orlando and Pittsburgh, um, started in Amsterdam, the whole nightlife mayor movement and nightlife manager. Uh, takes on a new realm of importance when it comes to transportation management. You know, some of these nightlife districts, you know, when the clubs let out, you don't want people drinking and driving and going home. So you want to make it easy to get an Uber or Lyft, a taxi cab. Some of them have lots and staging areas and enforcement hubs can get to where they need to go. They have all sorts of geofencing that, you know, you could actually, in an orderly way, arrange to get your Uber or Lyft. Um, so I think the nightlife issue is really important to take a, take a look at. Um, and keep on the back of your mind. And in my industry, this remains to be seen what actually happens. You know, the, the business travel industry, uh, business travel is starting to come back. There's a group known as the GBTA, which does a lot of uh, reports, the Global Business Travel Association. The limo industry basically came to a halt. Limos and black cars, pretty much when, when conferences stopped and people went on Zoom, everything just stopped. And what happened is, there's been a couple of companies now that have been pitching to the travel managers. Like when you go to Goldman Sachs, one of these big law firms, they have people whose job it is to arrange for the travel, like any big organization, for their employees. And they usually typically have RFPs and they have multiple black car limo companies. They primarily do that to get the cost down so everybody bids against each other, right? Kind of what government does. And now they're looking at corporate shuttles, right? Um, there's, you know, a company known as HIP that now rebranded itself and it's called HQ, which has been working with a high-end um, limo company where they were taking their buses that they don't use as frequently and shuttling employees to and from work with really cool technology that include, included contact tracing um, and, and more fancy buses to get people from one employer from, like, let's say, New Jersey to New York and have one drop off and, and different routes that are planned. It remains to be seen whether this is going to become normal or new, but it doesn't, it does affect ridership potentially. You know, this could have an impact on public transit. These are private intercity buses. Um, so it remains to be seen whether the, the travel managers are going to use these services, which have started to operate and started to land contracts. Flix bus rally, which, you know, was known as our bus and, HQ, which is formerly known as HIT, um, which is in the New York area, uh, are three examples of that. Now, my favorite topic is Uber. I want to thank our sponsor for being here. I I was the like public enemy number one to Uber from their very existence when I had tussles with Travis. I was head of the regulators group. We fought for years. I'm much happier with the leadership we have now. And I, I, I had to, like, I fell off my seat. I was at a conference and Caitlin from Uber Health was on a panel with the taxi people that were fighting like tooth and nail for the last 10 years, talking about how wonderful each other was. I'm like, what is going on here? And I was like, okay, so something's happening, you know? So I wasn't too shocked, honestly, when they decided that they're going to do a partnership in New York and then in San Francisco to basically get the entire fleet. And Cody will talk more about that partnership, but it only works one way for now and there's some regulatory issues that i'm sure we'll be working through but all of the regulators i represent they're happy that these two warring parties are now working with each other problem is is that now we have a lot of members of our group that are state tnc regulators and local taxi regulators and so the good news is we're trying to see if we can figure out a way to legalize a lot of this stuff if it needs to be but the, the essence of it is you'll be able to now on your uber app hit UberX and get a taxi cab to show up and, and, and pick you up. Um, and you'll be charged the UberX rate of fare, not the taxi rate of fare. It doesn't work the other way. You can't use the Curb or the Arrow apps that are for the taxi apps in New York City to order an Uber. 
So this is like a big deal in a lot of ways, um, you know, in terms of, you know, mitigating congestion. You know, we, we have so many vehicles in New York. This allows Uber to put all these vehicles on their their app platform and not add more cars to the streets. Um, it, it expands their driver pool um, and it gives them trip additional trip volume. They're talking about a, care, a cab fare increase anyway in New York City, but Uber did a fare increase already. So they're going to benefit from that and they're going to be able to get higher fares potentially, you know, than the, the, the metered rate of fare. So it's good for the drivers, um, you know, I, in my opinion, and it remains to be seen how it works out and whether passengers will be using it more or less. Um, it adds more wheelchair vehicles to the Uber platform. Um, you know, there's a lot of benefits of this, in my, in my opinion, um, and it remains to be seen. And I think I'll end on this before I turn it over. Um, I kind of think that public transit, taxis and TNCs, and, you know, we cover that a lot here, different conferences. We're all talking about the first and last mile stuff. This stuff works. Why it's still a pilot program and the FTA considers it such is beyond me. I think they need to fix it. I think every agency should be doing this. I think public uh, paratransit integration with TNCs and, and taxis, it saves money. It saved $10 million a year when I did it with MTA in New York. Uh, we have a brokerage and an EHAL uh, thing going on with, with the MTA where the, the savings are astronomical. You know, it's just a fixed a non-fixed route with multiple passengers who are in wheelchairs is not, first of all, good for them. You know, I mean, I don't, I, I wouldn't want to be waiting an extra amount of time because I have two more people piling into my vehicle. It should be point to point, one person or, you know, one group together to, and, and it really saves money. So I think that's the future, integrating with paratransit, nightlife mobility partnerships, getting business improvement districts, uh, nightlife managers to work with public transit and with taxis and TNCs to coordinate a safe exit for patrons and also for workers that are in the nightlife districts. Um, I think mobility as a service and AVs come later, you know, but the issues that we're dealing with now um, are these issues which have all worked. Okay, nightlife, there are templates for how we can get people home safely, public power transit, the brokerage model is the thing that's already working all over the country. And last but not least, the first mile, last mile partnerships, that is the key to equity. You know, underserved areas, transportation deserts, why shouldn't they be formalized? Once they do that, then we have mobility as a service, right? We'll be able to go from one place to another. So that's kind of my take on the future of mobility. Um, but we're going to have the, the, our panelists now talk a little bit about answering these questions, which we want to get your feedback on and ask you to answer these questions uh, after we're done. So what is the new normal in your opinion? Does this change how you relate to transit? And the third question is, how do you see shared modes behaving with non-work trips or working from home? So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Stacy from the partnership. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? How's everyone feeling? I know it's the end of the conference afternoon, so I got to pick up the energy. Yeah. <laughs> so my name is Stacey Matlin. I'm the director of innovation programs at the Partnership for New York City, which is a nonprofit that represents the business community in New York, and we represent over uh, 300 large employers across the city, who then represent 1 million New York City office workers. Um, and so we, our goal is to really leverage private sector resources to enable public sector goals. And back in 2018, the private sector uh, stood up and they said, you know, we think public transit is a fundamental backbone of the economy. We support public transit and we want to do what we can. We want to help uh, in any way we can. And so the partnership for New York City representing the business community worked with the MTA to create a public-private partnership called uh, the Transit Innovation Partnership. And through that, we do a lot of different strategic programs and initiatives to help uh, the public sector and the public transit agencies in New York um, integrate technology, leverage public sector resources and their private sector resources. And the Transit Tech Lab is an annual program that helps the agencies test new technologies in a way that works best for them. And that's the main program that I run. So today I'll be answering the questions that Matt posed in the beginning um, through the lens of the Partnership for New York City and the Transit Tech Lab. So, the first question is around, you know, what is the new normal? What does it look like for you in your opinion? So the partnership, ever since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been surveying our uh, 300 employer members who represent the million office workers in New York 
and asking them on a quarterly basis, you know, what is your return off this policy? What does this look like? And we just got back last week, uh, Q2 of 2022, uh, what the survey was. And so we got 160 employers to respond that represent a wide variety of industries. And what we found is that really work from home is here to stay. So this, these are quite shocking changes if you look at this. So the employers in New York that employ a hybrid working model, today 78% have a hybrid working model. Before the pandemic, that was 6%. That's crazy. Like, like that is that is quite a shocking change. And then employers with a mandatory daily attendance policy, post-pandemic, that's only 10%. Before the pandemic, that was 84%. These are really shocking numbers. I mean, I'm, I'm sure to all of you, it doesn't, it's not that surprising, but just to see these numbers on the PowerPoint, I think is pretty, like it, it shows how drastic the change has been over the past few years. And so employers, they want people to come back to the office. 91% of employers are encouraging employees to return to the office with two thirds offering at least one incentive from social activities, meals, transportation subsidies, childcare, but really employees remain flexible. So in, as of May, 2022, only 38% of employees are back in the average weekday, 28% are fully remote and the rest are in between. So really we're seeing, and, and in this labor market, I, I think I agree with Matt that this is here to stay. Employees wanna remain flexible. So we're, we're here, this is the new normal. And in terms of how this affects um, shared rides, I think what we've seen is transit ridership is down and travel patterns are changing. So pretty consistently, these are numbers from last week from the MTA. So we have bus ridership, subway ridership, and then commuter railroad from Metro North. Um, pretty consistently, it might, it might be hard to see, but it's on weekdays, average weekday, it's about 60% of pre-pandemic levels. Uh, and that's the average weekday. And, and, and so, so we're still we're kind of on par with what the national average is. But then if you look at Sunday, 75%, 76%, Metro North Commuter Railroad, 91% comparable to pre-pandemic day. That means that people are beginning to use transit and they're, they're not maybe as, as much as they used to, but they're they're using it in different ways. And especially on the weekends, they're, they're a lot more flexible. And so what agencies really need are clear processes and tools to adapt to this new normal. And that's really where the transit tech lab, ooh, it's in. So as mentioned, we, the Transit Tech Lab is a program part of this larger public-private partnership uh, that we enable regional transit agencies to test new technologies that solve their key challenges on an annual basis. And how it works, we have a six-step clear process. It starts with agencies tell us what their biggest challenges are for the year that they'd like to focus on. We then go out to the global startup community and ask, hey, here's the challenge, what can you do to solve that? And we facilitate an online application process. From there, experts from the agencies evaluate those online applications. They can select companies to do a pitch presentation to better understand what that really means. And then agencies can select companies to do an eight-week proof of concept for that initial test to understand, you know, does this work in the context of our system? Does this technology actually do what it says it does on that, that pitch presentation? Um, and after that, uh, companies can be selected to do a year-long pilot. And that's really a deeper test to understand, does this add significant value? Is this something that's really meeting our needs? And is it something that we think is a scalable solution? And after that, then companies can, agencies can decide to move forward and uh, work through a commercial procurement and a commercial relationship with that solution. And so to date, we've been around since 2018, we've hosted eight challenges. We've had over 650 applications come through our system. And we've had 33 eight-week proof of concepts, 15 pilots, and five commercial procurements. So we've been busy continuing to flow through the process. And we work with all the major New York City regional agencies from the MTA, New Jersey Transit, DOT, and Port Authority of New York, New Jersey. So getting back to the original question of how does this you know, change how, or how can technology support the, the new normal or, or changing um, circumstances with COVID-19. So back in 2020, uh, in, in partnership with all the agencies when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, agencies wanted new tools to respond. And so we launched the COVID-19 challenge that asked the question, how can we make the transit safer, healthier, and more responsive amid the COVID-19 pandemic? So we went through the typical process and to date we are currently at the end of testing three pilots. 
uh, with Beyond, CitySwift, and Kinos. So Beyond, they're an uh, e-bike, e-scooter company. They have foldable, releasable e-bikes and e-scooters, and they are specifically designed to work within the transit-friendly environment. And they are creating a playbook to how to safely integrate micromobility with public transit. CitySwift, they're a software company, and they work with bus planners to help provide siloed data streams in a very uh, streamlined dashboard that enables bus planners to uh, easily make decisions with real-time data. Um, they also have ways to do simulations of, um, of bus schedules to make that process easier, and then they also have a way to visualize uh, with 90% uh, accuracy what the capacity levels are on buses, even if you don't have any uh, automatic people counting on all of the buses. And then Kinos, they are a color additive to bleach, and they help cleaners at facilities uh, self-monitor and understand where cleaning is happening. And so in their eight-week proof of concept, they uh, Port Authority measured a 63% improvement in disinfection coverage uh, within the facility. So these are just examples of the tools and technologies that have been tested through the initial COVID-19 uh, challenge. So the last question around how does this relate to transit or how, how does this change how you relate to transit? So the big elephant in the room right now, at least in New York, is talking about safety. If you talk to an average New Yorker on the street and you ask them about their public transit patterns, they might be like, well, I don't know. I, I don't know. It always feels safe. It feels different from what it did pre-pandemic. Um, and really, safety is a top concern for riders. So the MTA did a customer count survey where they surveyed 123,000 riders, and that's the number of riders who responded. <laughs> so it was a pretty big response rate, and they cited crime and cleanliness during the COVID-19 pandemic as the top concern for lapsed riders by MTA customers. And then the partnership, we've also conducted uh, surveys for our employees, and 74% of those who use public transit say safety on the train uh, on subway or sorry, on transit in general has gotten worse. And then 94% of employees say not enough is being done to address homelessness, mental illness, followed by assault and gun violence. So these are the top issues that people are citing as uh, being apprehensive towards transit. And so it's a major concern and it's something that we have to think about. And luckily we now in New York, for the first time in a while, we have both a mayor and a governor who are working together. Uh, so that's great to see. And they have worked together to create, um, there's the mayor has the, um, blueprint to reduce gun violence. There's also the subway safety plan, which helps um, the, the state also put resources to this as well, but it's essentially a way to have a lot of different social service programs working together to help uh, eliminate the initial cause of a lot of the safety concerns of mental illness, homelessness, and, and providing those social services. So really at the end of the day, public policy and, and those political decisions are important to address the underlying issues but there is room for technology, and that's where the Transit Tech Lab fits in. So the Transit Tech Lab enables uh, agencies to tech technology to meet rider needs. And in 2020, January 2020, we worked with all the agencies to launch the Recovery Challenge, which asked the question, how can we support the recovery of public transit and deliver service that gets customers back? So we were looking for use cases around you know, real-time data to help agencies be more responsive uh, to customer needs and also technologies that can increase safety and customer perception uh, of safety. And a real use case that is uh, of, of need right now, um, in, in 2020, January 2020, uh, there was a fatal incident where a woman, Michelle Goh, was pushed into the subway tracks and she was killed. And this is a very simple example of technology that could have been used if there is existing uh, cameras that already are monitoring the rail system or the, the, the subway tracks could automatically detect if a person's in the track and then notify the subway to stop, that could have saved a life. And so this is an example of how uh, simple technology could help uh, improve safety in the subway system. So these are examples. Uh, we actually launched the eight-week proof of concept last week, and so we are thrilled and very excited by this, and we're excited to see whether the results show. Unfortunately, um, the, we have not put out the press release, so I can't really speak about the details, but that's coming next week. If you want to go to our website, transitinnovation.org, next week we will have the press release live, so you can learn more. Uh, but really, in conclusion, you know, agencies need tools to be more responsive to customers. COVID-19, I think, showed how you need to be more responsive, you need to meet customer needs. And while technology is not always the solve for all of these issues, it can help 
and agencies need processes and, and ways to facilitate that testing of new technology in a safe way. And the Transit Tech Lab is an able to do that. So happy to answer any questions at the end, but would love to hear from Uber, from, from Cody from Uber, um, about what he's been doing. Thank you, Stacy. So like I said, I'm Cody. I work on Uber's transit team and uh, manage our transit partnerships. Um, so at large, Uber as a very large entity, global entity, uh, we are re reimagining the way the world moves for the better. What we do on the transit team is a little bit more of a specified mission. Um, we wanna empower communities to reimagine public transit by leveraging our network, platform, and tech to enhance the rider experience, give agencies more flexibility, and improve the experience for the rider. So we all know that transit is the core of urban, regional, rural mobility systems. Um, and where we're going is, you know, I think at a shared use mobility conference, we all know that we need access to many services seamlessly. Um, so platforms need to act as, you know, a way to provide information and give, you know, options to riders that that make sense. So here you can see, you know, a in any app, you know, being able to access car share, being able to see uh, a public transit route and the journey planning that goes along with it, um, bike sharing, uh, a TNC trip. So from our team's perspective, you know, we see that transit faces a lot of issues. Um, a lot of challenges coming out of the pandemic, uh, decreasing ridership, um, you know, labor shortages, um, vehicle procurement, supply chains causing prices to go up. Um, and we do see that some of Uber's core strengths um, can help with some of those issues. Um, those being, you know, a lot of the cost pressures and, you know, a lot of the supply issues that agencies are facing. So as an example of how we work with agencies, um, I would say, you know, on one side, you know, there's sort of the one off, you know, we need to work with Uber to uh, fix an app, a service outage. Um, so these are an example is Marta. So there's a service outage. They don't want to resource putting together bus bridges to, you know, one, get the staff to out there. Um, and then get the vehicles out. So they will send out a QR code and cover the cost of an Uber trip um, for a specific amount of time up to a certain amount of money. Uh, moving further down the list um, for pre-planned service outages. We have a lot of partners who say, hey, we're working on this capital project. Can we work with you to you know, basically do the same? Provide trips for riders in advance and give that notification um, so the transit agency can, you know, communicate the service outage and then give the rider the information they need to make sure they can get where they're going. Um, and then, you know, sort of moving along, uh, sort of rider's choice programs. Um, we have uh, partnerships with DART and MBTA in Boston on sort of complementary paratransit programs where riders opt into a program. This serves as another on-demand option um, that can be same day where the agency can sort of control the parameters of the program, how often it can be used, what the subsidy level is, um, and then riders can take trips uh, at a specific quantity on a, on a monthly basis. And then uh, for City of Kyle and Innisfil, uh, these are programs that actually like use Uber's fleet to serve as their transit system. So they create a we create a specific product ID in the app where a rider can see, you know, plug in origin and destination. If it falls within parameters, they can see a customized vehicle view that is for their transit agency and then and book that trip in the Uber app. To give you a little bit more of a local example, uh, we are in Chicago. So I thought I would just talk a, briefly about Connect to Work. Uh, this is a program uh, that launched, uh, I think pandemic time, uh, late, 2020, early 2001, 2021. Uh, and this program is sponsored by the Village of Bedford Park, the Cook County, and the RTA in Chicago. Um, and the tech providers are Via, uh, Uber, Move It. 
Um, and then SEMC and the Antero group sort of work as the project delivery team for this project. Um, the goals of this, of connect to work is Bedford Park, for any of you who are not familiar with Chicago, has more jobs than actual residents. So uh, there's a big issue of these workers being able to get to employers like Sintest or Home Chef, um, or accessing uh, the mall, the Fort City Mall uh, to the east. There's also some transit connections that happen here. Uh, CTA Orange Line Station, also a bus hub. Uh, the, the routes are very centric towards, you know, the parts of the city of Chicago, not so much Bedford Park. Pace has some service there too, but, you know, the village of Bedford Park not fully uh, serviced the way it needs to be in order for these workers to get to their employers. So we offer two different programs with uh, Bedford Park. One is a late night ride, late night ride so just uh, trip subsidies for uh, folks who are working late shifts, they can ride anywhere in Cook County um, from, I think, 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, and then first last mile trips during, for daytime. Um, and the Village of Bedford Park controls that subsidy. Um, Via, I know Via's in the room. Uh, they provide the accessible shuttle. Um, there's also a micro transit component to it. So I really love this program. Uh, it's emblematic of tech and a lot of government agencies working together to solve a problem. And, you know, the goals are to connect people to one, first and foremost, their jobs that they need to go to, um, and then, you know, providing transit connections, um, and then being able to build upon that with employers and getting more employers involved. So I thought I would just end here and just talk about some of the larger initiatives. I know I work on a very specific team at Uber, I think, Everyone's interested in what Uber is doing as a whole as well. So some of our larger initiatives that is also very uh, of interest to our transit partners is the relaunching of Uber Pool, which will be Uber X Share. If you haven't seen it already, we've started waves of bringing this back. Obviously, we also stopped shared rides during the pandemic. Um, and we have started in New York, uh, Chicago, uh, Miami, um, and this will be mo moving uh relaunch month by month based on the sort of marketplace uh, realities that we see in terms of drivers get coming back to the platform. Um, and then Matt talked about uh, the taxi partnership. Um, you know, I had that slide about, you know, a platform being a one-stop shop for giving you all the options. We really are excited about the taxi partnership. Um, it will not even have to allow a taxi driver to be using the Uber app. So the API that will be in place will basically allow that trip to be brokered through the uh, the app that the driver is already using today, which is really cool. And they can accept or deny that trip. Uh, they're not forced the trip at all. Um, but yeah, just key takeaways. Uh, we're really excited to give riders and agencies more flexibility. Uh, and that all comes with you know, giving the information about what's available, uh, what's available to a rider. Um, and just that partnership enables creative solutions. So we're really proud to work with over 60 transit agencies and continue to be a partner in making sure that some of the challenges they face today um, that we can, you know, help and, you know, help transit get back uh, to pre-pandemic levels, if that's where it goes. Um, but if in short, helping with the issues that we see today out on the street. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'll finish this out. Okay. What I'd like to start with is just a brief overview. Um, to meet with Enterprise this is a division of Enterprise Holdings, and it's our hand folding division. Uh, we've been around over 40 years in the business. We have over 8,000 van pools currently operating in 47 states. We have 75 public transit partnerships to help buy down the cost of that service that we provide. And our impact on the environment, 992 million commuter miles annually and 771 million pounds of carbon emissions are reduced annually. So just wanted to start with a brief overview there. Next, I wanna just really quickly touch on what is a van pool? It's basically a large carpool. Groups of five to 15 riders that live in a common area, they'll find each other, put it together, and put a group together. 
It's a shared driving responsibility and it's a volunteer responsibility. So there isn't paid drivers there. They share the costs. And typically, like I said, it's part of public transit through our partnerships with tra uh, transit agencies. And it's true shared mobility. So just to briefly run through that, I wanted to touch on how it's a shared mobility. Again, five to 15 people can get connected with a van pool. They choose a vehicle, they meet at an origin, and then they head to work. So it's an A to B. The benefits that are provided are outstanding for our, for our riders. You know, from a van pool standpoint, it's usually $200 a month versus single operated vehicle commuting. What's included in a van pool program? Well, the SCV, our, our brand new van, 24 seven roadside assistance, preventative maintenance, comprehensive insurance, and then a month to month payment. So why van pool? And I'll run through these really quick, but it reduces parking needs. And before the pandemic, that was maybe more of a large concern, uh, but we still see many of the urban areas or congested areas that use our use van pool services in general. It usually eliminates up to six van pool spots per group that's put together. So a sizable difference. We touched on con congestion mitigation and reduced emissions. With that being said, it's definitely one of the most biggest sales we have from an environmental standpoint, because it is such a significant impact for not only the group, but also the employer that would be potentially sponsoring that program. Safety and efficiency, definitely another piece that we touch on. One of the safest modes of transit. And when you look at the program itself, particularly partnered with public agencies or transit agencies, a net profit return when used in the right way for a program. And then most importantly, expanding the reach of transit, which we're talking about here in the meeting today, which is, okay, well, how does it help expand the reach of what our current modes are? Okay. okay, here you'll see an example of an urban transit route map. While light rail and fixed bus routes provide coverage to many areas, there still remain some underserved areas where available services can fill that gap. Whether it's off-peak commutes like manufacturing or distribution center third shifts, or locations that are not in a location where public transportation and last mile services can consistently operate. Van pools can provide a cost effective and equitable option for those customers. Looking deeper into the opportunities to service those areas, what about the residents that are living downtown that are working out, out, out of town, if you will? We, we can, you know, van pools can provide a solution for people who live in the city but need an effective and reliable way to get out of town. Second, moving people and not cars efficiently. Van pool provides newer vehicles. So usually model years, either this year or the year before, and you can put a lot of passengers in it. So simply put, when we touch from an environmental standpoint, if gaps can be filled and supplement on top of what the public transportation modes are already there, and you can do it with an effective and efficient and, uh, and lower emission vehicle, there's nothing but plus signs to add to the urban core that we have here as an example. Most importantly, We've seen work, uh, work sites and partners with van pool programs not only retain more employees, but expand their workforce, meaning they have folks that need a reliable way to get to work, so attendance increases, as well as the opportunity to continue to grow their business. All right, we're going to take it a little bit further out and look beyond the urban core. I think I've got a couple more here, yep. Vanpool begins to bring a larger picture on how it provides commute solutions beyond the reach of the existing public transportation. In this example, you'll see how we define the last mile on the right within the city as the main modes of completing trips to end destinations, which we've been talking about for the last two, two days, really, is what are those? As we move further out, you'll see additional modes like the fixed bus and light rail that we touched on on the last slide. They're also represented uh, as one of the main modes when you look at the urban or within five miles. That's what the plan is. But when you move out further, whether it be miles or time to commute, we begin to find how effective van pools can service groups of people that are in the surrounding suburban areas. Groups of people who share civil origins that are outside the stretch of most public transportation options. Destinations that are realistically close enough so when they come into town, they can either use last mile or if they're a worksite driven van pool group, they don't need a last mile, they're going right to their worksite. 
Take a look even further out, and that's the distant that we have listed on the left. Think of those as either distant or rural customers that have a larger commute on a daily basis. Those customers can prove to have the most challenges when finding a way to work, and it could force them into a single operated vehicle situation more often than most. Vanpool can be a solution for those folks when a group can be formed within the same route. And last, and, and I'll touch on it here, and I didn't hit it on the last one, but a reverse commute is what we briefly touched on. That's why we have the arrows going in and out, because it can be used both ways. And it can be used and supplement and complement the other public transportation modes once you're in town. So it represents, fun, represents fundamental gaps in other public transportation services that we all experience and provides a solution for it. It'll be in collaboration with the other modes, and that's currently how a lot of those programs operate. But it also can be, give people that otherwise might not have the same equity access to services given their location or work schedule. All right, so how does VanPool support return to work or return to office? Take a look here, and I know you touched on a little bit with Stacy. There are a lot of people that won't be heading to work on a full-time basis, but there will be certain work sites or types of work that will have to, and we're seeing that. We did a survey on our existing customers and potential van pool customers outside of just commute with enterprise, and over 70% of them expect to go back five plus days. So if you look at the pie, there's a large amount of folks that aren't going to be going back to work full-time, and there's folks that are expecting to. Within that median uh, that Matt had pointed out when we were raising our hands in the beginning, there's a good chunk where if you can see here, 25% are expecting three to four days. Well, the program that we just ran through is traditionally a five day or six day van pool based off of the way it's been. Van pool programs, particularly commute with enterprise understand we need to shift. So to answer that question is how we're going to shift, I'll give you some ideas on what we're already doing as a company to move that way. We're evolving into an individual focus type of program. It's always been a van pool level program where the group's put together and there's a coordinator with a volunteer driver situation that handles it. What we wanna do is look at individual focus, customer service, offerings, availability to drill it down to almost the seat level, if you will, so that that flexibility is there. That leads into riding the days you want. Specifically, what we're here to talk about is, okay, well, how do we fit the hybrid work schedule? If it's not Monday through Friday, if it's two days a week, if it's three days a week, what service or offering can be provided where you're paying for what you need and what you want? An all-inclusive price. Earlier when I was running through some of the benefits of what our program is, which is fuel, uh, which is insurance, which is emergency ride home, which is all of those things that a customer that's using public transportation finds valuable, is wrapped up in a transparent price. That's our goal is to have it simple and have it easy moving forward. Auto check-in and accuracy and rider reporting, this is the big one, not only for convenience for the customer as they as they track their ridership, but for our federal, for our, for our local customers that have NTD reporting, because we know that those funds are moving back into the system, and if we have accuracy and rider reporting, it's going to capture more of that data. And then most importantly, what we talked about here and, and what the goal is with MOS down the road, will be a better fit if we're individual. We'll have an opportunity to have a part of that platform where Vanpool is an option along with all the other public transportation modes. So just based off of where we're heading and a couple of things that I've touched on, it's, it's evident that this can be added in and supplemented for a lot of the programs that are currently existing and only help provide more equitable opportunities for folks to get in and out to work and back. So that's what I've got. Thank you very much. Thank you.